Right, I have to say a huge thank you to Alfonso Boragan, who took far too many planes to be here today, because he came from the island of Jeju in, uh, in South Korea. He's extremely jet-lagged, uh, so it's, uh, it's a miracle he's, he's, still, he's still standing. Anyway, Alfonso Boragan is a multidisciplinary artist. He is from the region of Cantabria in the north of Spain and he teaches at University College London. Uh, his practice is, is articulated between research, teaching, and production. So that was the easy part. Now I'd like to explain uh, what kind of work Alfonso does, and it is going to get messy, because he's interested in so many different topics, and I guess that's what makes him so interesting. So the first time I, I read something uh, about him, I discovered his work was in early 2022, he had written an essay about um, people who choose to uh, ingest stones. And so he, he wrote this essay that I found quite extraordinary about uh, the ingestion of stones and their biological inscription in the, in the human body. And then a few weeks ago, Carmen and I were in a video conference with Alfonso. At the time, he was in Bolivia, another very far away country. And uh, he was telling us about the work he was doing with shamans. And so he has also, Alfonso has also worked with beehives, uh, with the ingestion of light, with the memory of rivers, and with the, the print uh, of water. And he worked on many other topics. But he's actually not here to talk about that today. He's here to talk um, about, uh, I think, a very ambitious and extraordinary project, which is actually exhibited downstairs called uh, The Sea Journey. Uh, so that's what he's going to talk about. Um, he's part of a collective of artists called Future Farmers. And back in 2016, uh, Alfonso took part uh, in an expedition that was trying to uh, retrace the journey that uh, ancient cereal seeds had undertaken thousands of years ago. And uh, so they went on this magnificent wooden boat and they started a, a sailing journey that started in Oslo and then sailed towards the Mediterranean. And the crew was composed of artists, of activists, of environmentalists, of uh, scientists, of anthropologists. Uh, on board, they also took a number of green seeds, like traditional green seeds to make bread. Some of them had been lost, some of them had been forgotten, and, and they found them again. So, like, a, a crew of very different, different personalities and knowledge, all these seeds, but then Alfonso, being someone who's always bringing the unexpected, decided to invite on board also a number of worms. Yes, worms. Um, and that's what he's going to talk about um, in a lecture that has a very intriguing uh, and poetical title. It's called Maybe Memory is a Process of Forgetfulness. Here we are. So thank you, Regine and Carmen, for the invitation. And thanks, Janice and Elaine, for hosting us here. So it's complex to talk about others. And I think from all the presentation that Regine has been did a minute ago, I think it's important to understand from my side the, the part of inscription. I'm very obsessed. From, with inscription. I come from photography, um, and that's been a very big part. Even in the eating of stones, for me, it's a process of getting exposed to this other matter. And this other matter is really important in what I'm going to talk about a, a little bit. This is a presentation of our collective I Am Part. We are many. Uh, we have a big engine that is called Amy Franceschini. Future Farmers is a um, very big machinery or animal that we all live in. And we have a kind of different personality when we use and live in future farmers. So I'm going to tell you a history. And I think that's what the seed journey was about and what future farmers is about. It's about activating. It's about growing. It's about farming. It's about the relation we have with land. But it's, the seed journey was a journey and a history that we were creating and recreating because it was a journey back. We were de-making or unmaking a process of the seeds that were grown in the, um, 
in the Middle East. So the Crescent Fertile, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, what's probably the origin of wheat. I'm gonna read a little text from Michael Tausig, uh, an introduction that he explains very nicely what the journey was. I am trying to imagine a fantastic voyage from Norway to the Middle East in a beauty wooden sailing boat built for Arctic voyaging, carrying nothing but a small box of seeds. Surreal to a fault, this voyage is at once mythical, scientific, and political in intention and implication, but above all, a lead of the imagination. The little box within this boat contains a few handful of most unusual grains, all stocks uncommon today, found in the cracks between planks in an old sauna in Norway and in a plant institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. The boat is their container as much as is the little box such that their preciousness may manifest by the wild disproportion in size, grants them an almost fetish character. Like the Kula King values, the Trojan Islands in the Southwest Pacific that pass from hand to hand as gifts from island to island loaded with a magic spells. The contrast involved in this voyage from Norway, for Nor Norway are always global in their emotional, historic, and geographical reckoning. Wheat is said to derive from the Middle East, possibly from Eastern Turkey, land of the Kurds, now embarked on a feminist and democratic federalist future. So we can speak of this voyage as return or the retracing of a very ancient route combining human and non-human initiative by which wheat was domesticated from the wild and then slowly made its way through gifts, trade, winds, and sea currents from the highly cultured Middle East to the barbarians of the North. So, I'm gonna tell you how everything started because I think it's important to go back and then we will finish what was my role in the trip and then open into questions. But everything was based on those seeds. These seeds is the ones that Michael says that were found in between the planks of a sauna. An anthropologist called Martin Tensberg, he found about some very ancient, he was reading about some very ancient seeds of rye that stopped being farmed in the early 20th century. And he found in the text that these seeds were dried in a sauna. So drying is really important and more when you are in northern countries that is the only way to preserve the seeds. So he tried to, found, to find these seeds. And he started finding, looking in the sauna in different places. He couldn't find it until he thought that might be in the good end under the sauna. So he unmounted the sauna and found nine grains of this very ancient rye. He grew them and seven flourished. These seven now are millions because he started to give to farmers and grow again this rye. This rye that has a very particular uh, thing that is that is not as productive as the other, but it's very ancient, has, in terms of wheat, it will have less gluten and different qualities, okay? So it's not as productive, and that's the important thing, but creates diversity, and that's what the seed journey has been trying. So the journey started with this rye and the wheat of St. Saint Petersburg. And that's the journey. The idea was to go directly by boat, but we got only to North Spain to get uh, the grains there, and then everything in the Mediterranean started to be a bit messy. That's the third leg, never happened properly or as we wanted. Uh, I mean, that's a long history, but I think it's important to see how all this was happening. But I am still going back. I'm gonna go where that started because the seed journey is part of another big project called the Flatbread Society. Mm, 
sorry, the sound is not connected now. No, it's connected there, but I think it's my computer. So you understand from the text, no? What happened? That was the 
celebration, ritual celebration, to open this space. The space, uh, I'm going to explain now, but it was a complex commission by the Norwegian government in Oslo. But the interesting thing is that this inauguration or opening of the space was bringing all these soils from farmers to that place to create a seed with the soil that will be growing. And now it's grown. It's growing, and that's where the rye was farmed. And that's where the seed journey started in a way. So it's complex because that was, it started in 2012 and was a really long commission uh, where in Oslo they are developing all the sites that you see in the left, MOOC Museum, I mean the government is putting the development and they invest it and they ask future farmers to do something, a public artwork in that space. And we found that the, this area was a farming area, really important in a certain time. So what we decided is to farm again in this land, in a place that was full of huge buildings that were being developed. So keeping this kind of piece of land, protect that piece of land. And the, sign, the, the signing, the contract everyone was signing is the contract of responsibility that will pass to others to keep that land farming all the time. And the ritual was, and the signature was this soil. No? This soil from all Norway traveling to the city for days until it was this procession to start and signify this place that will be growing. It was a beautiful, I mean, this action for me is that today is this space. So after all this process of farming, everything started to be about wheat and rye and bread. And what we did was an oven that could cook all the possible breads we were able to gather from around the world but especially one, the flat bread, that is the most basic and most powerful bread all around Earth, because it's so simple to do, and it's probably the first bread we made as humans, and that's the oven you see on the right. But you can make other kinds of bread, so it's a bakery, but it's a collective space, cooperative, that gathers people, histories, and seeds. And seeds were starting to be so important and this diversification of genetics that traveled from the Middle East, and now they were in Norway, so north. And it's bread, and bread is the revolution of eating. I mean, as humans, probably we are what we are, thanks to grains. You know? So that's the flatbread society. And then is when we started with the idea, this idea of that, Amy said, a history about wheat that is the history about migrations, reverse engineering, civilization, domestication, and genetics. So the idea was to make back or unmake the journey of these seeds through the sea and sailing back with this boat. Why a boat? I mean, was a kind of dream of going to this boat and was all the time in our imagination this idea of sailing back? So in the idea of migration, the idea of colonization, but we found this boat. That happens a lot in future farmers. Things are constructed by chance. One thing takes you to another, and everything is, ends being huge. I mean, that was immense. This boat is a rescue boat. Which we, they, we have only three in Norway, but they were used in the Second World War. And they are very particular boats because they are really wide inside. And they can save, I think that you can keep 16 or 17 people inside. So this boat was sunk in the North Sea for four years or three years. And the family that owns the boat bring it back. They put all their savings to bring back that boat that was 1,000 meters down. So they had a problem with the mast, the, the, the main sail is not very well, the engineer is not very well made in a very big storm in the North Sea. It starts smashing until the boat starts to have water inside. They are well safe, but the boat was sunk. So we're sailing in a boat that still had the traces of being under the sea. So the animals that were eating the boat were still marked inside. So it was a piece of the sea inside the boat. And I mean, everything was such an history that we decided with the Johansson, the Johansson brothers, that they are three, two sail with us that were the captains, 
to travel back. And in each port we stopped, we will bring the seeds and exchange new seeds and rescue other seeds. So it was a question of gathering farmers, people interested in that, but above all the farmers keeping all these ancient seeds, bringing our own seeds that we were rescuing for other places, but also trying to rescue new seeds from other zonas, from churches, people that knew places where the seeds were stored. So we're finding these places that in the past so I'm gonna tell you the last part that was the one in Spain, and I think is what we are exhibiting here. Something really important for us is this piece, that we wanted to bring it, but it was really difficult to ship it because it was in California at that moment. But for Amy, that's really important for us. I mean, it's a piece that I think was a lot in the imagination of Amy, but it's the seeds of time, we call them. And they are the two seeds the rye and the wheat that originated, and they mix and they create a clock of this time that is mixing past and future, because our futures in these grains and the genetics of these grains are exceptionally important. In fact, you know wheat is the most genetically modified plant in history. And it's a theory that says that is wheat who, so is we modifying Wheat or is wheat modifying us? Who is changing? So maybe we are the slaves of wheat, that we made wheat that productive and huge. So we allow wheat, because it doesn't have legs, brain, and other many things, so it was using us as a parasite to allow wheat to develop. So they are, I mean, this, these theories are beautiful to understand how much and powerful this is. So these gatherings are so important, very powerful. Each place a dream, very different. And it's the voices of farmers and the voices of, and this wheat and these grains, rye, wheat, but of all wheat, uh, is not as productive as the one is grown normally. So we are looking for this diversity, but usually it's a small plant, the grain is small. So it has, it's a variety that, varieties that are very, yeah, they are not as good to make money. That have less gluten, you can make not that good bread because it's not gluteminous, no? It doesn't join that well. And this is the exchange and the contracts and keeping those. And each sport, we took new ones and we bring back. We gave more new seeds to grow because the important for us is the diaspora. I don't know how I feel about that, but I think it was important at that moment is still and we were creating this diaspora of seeds and making them grow. Seeds are to grow. And they were back to the boat. No? And we traveled the boat and we went to the next port until we got to Santander. That this is the end, the north of Spain, and it's when the seeds walk. Something, I mean, the seeds we found in Santander uh, were two, we rescued two seeds. One was in the house of a very old person. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you now in the map, but this person had them in the, in the rooftop of his house, and he said he, he, grow, he grew them 40, 50 years ago, so we managed to grow that again, but we found some in the uh, bricks, in the adobe bricks of one house. So the guy that owned the house that is now an ethnological museum, he said, I know in these walls is, is wheat. And he started destroying a part of the wall to find the bricks and to find these seeds that probably from the, from the Middle Ages. We didn't manage to make that grow again because it's too old. But we, I mean, we bring it even to seed uh, specialists and laboratories and was no way. But the very important thing here also is the um, Ignacio Chapela and the arrival of Ignacio. Plus the orography of the place we are talking. I'm gonna show you a map because I think it's kind of important. Uh, yeah, here we are. So that's where we are in North Spain, where wheat was not grown at all. 
wheat was growing very poorly in that area. Ignacio Chapela is a genetist that teaches in Berkeley. He lost his laboratory with 30 people because of Monsanto, because he generated, he's a, it's incredible, origins from Mexico, growing US, Chapela that he says that probably is Basque, and he came to Spain, flew to Spain, just to travel with these seeds through Picos de Europa. And he said, I'm gonna walk that, because it's a personal thing. He lost his laboratory because he created a, a genetic uh, analysis that cost one dollar. So you can, he says you can ask a question to this, an, to, to this analysis and it will tell you yes or no. But the important thing is that it was saying what was genetically modified by Monsanto or other companies that want just to create seeds that are not reproductive, just productive. So you have to buy them every year. And with that, Monsanto jumped on him and he lost the laboratory. Today his classes are walking to the sunset. So like he doesn't have a lab, he takes his students and walks to the sunset once a week. I mean, Ignatius is a dream. And something that is really important in this land is that we, Ignacio came, Mexican, and corn appeared in the project. Because the farmer revolution in North Spain, especially Asturias and Cantabria, was corn. Because wheat was no productive. I mean, it's really rainy, really cloudy, and wheat only was for rich the Hidalgos was the high society that had bread. The farmers had made bread with uh, walnuts, imagine. So it's like, was really, really poor until corn arrived with the colony, 16th century. And then it was the revolution because they could grow corn everywhere and make bread. And our bread is made with corn. It has, I mean, different names, tortus, uh, the only place that you could find corn was here, where we found in the, in the house of this of Jose. But all this area is the one that has and contains a, a lot of, wheat, of corn. And that's the seeds you have. Seeds that were lost in Mexico, some of them, and people from Asturias bring them back to Mexico and say, I have that seed that you are looking for because it was kept in Asturias. So, and that's the mountains that Ignacio was crossing. And he walked all these mountains to get to inland, that is the space, the space of Fernando García Dori. So, all that is the history of, in Spain, and the journey of Ignacio. So we had a new seed, and is the seed that is mostly Easy, more, uh, easiest to genetically modify corn. It's the most dangerous one because it gets polluted really easily. So Ignacio walked with all these seeds to inland and then is when the journey started to be complex in ways that was land, boat, and the Mediterranean part that was never developed properly as we really wanted because each stop was I mean, an archive of information, exchanges, and so many things. Here you have the, that's Ignacio. I mean, that's the life of Ignacio, no? Fighting against that, looking for this plurality. And then it was the collision of myself in that journey. And I bring these guys, these other beings to us. This is called C. elegans. They are one millimeter worms. These worms are one of the beings, or probably the being, more used in the laboratories for genetic modification, DNA modification, and memory. Because it's a very simple being. It has 302 neurons and 956 or 59 cells. So it's such a simple being that you can track it. So when Amy invited me and, well, future farmers, when they decided to, that I will be part of the queue, they asked me, what would you do for us? Or what will you do? What is your, and I said, I'm gonna, I want to document, to document, I want to be the memory of that journey. And memory is a process of forgetting. So 
memory, our neurons work in a way that everything is the relations they create between them and with the outside. So memory doesn't exist by itself. It's not something that is there and you'll find it. It's a relation of things. So I was playing with this situation, with my background and my interest as an artist, and I bring these worms to document the journey. So these worms have to be every two or three days. We had to they reproduce. We had thousands of them, and where they they were exponentially being reproduced. They grow in a bacteria, and yet there you see the bacteria, the fungus, and this is what they do in the labs. So this is the synapses. They genetically modify these worms that they can glow in darkness to know how the synapses work, for example. All the, is the only or the first being, not the only, but the first being that we have a neuronal map and we know how their neurons work precisely. So with Ignacio was this collision all the time. He said, how are you bringing this monster to us? And I said, because we need the paradox. And probably it's the only animal that will really remember this journey. And we will be able to read that. So that's the bringing the C elegance. And also the joke that Amy had a lot that is C of C, but C of C as well, no? Uh, and today, this is the memory of the journey. So these worms were back after the journey to a lab. And they read them. And this is the reading, this is the memory of the journey and the image. And I hope, I'm not completely sure, that they, they promise that they will keep reproducing and keeping these worms alive. Because it's, the memory is stored in their genetics. So they go generation to generation is one of the particularity they have. So this modification, the, the way how the synapses work, trespass genetically to the others. So they learn genetically. That is probably what we do, but we don't know if we do. That's what they believe, you know? Our brain is much more complex. Uh, so yeah, I think that's it, having the monster with us. But the monster is the only one that remembers really the trip. So thank you. <laughs>